Welcome back to Curbside Consults, where we break down the practice-changing research from New England Journal of Medicine. I'm your host, I'm Dr. Angela Chen. I'm one of this year's editorial fellows at NEJM. So whether you're in the emergency department, the ICU, or on the wards, I think it's safe to say every medical resident will manage acute myocardial infarction at some stage. So on today's episode, we'll be taking a deeper dive into the literature behind the very real challenges of managing a patient with acute MI who has progressed on to cardiogenic shock. To give everyone a little bit of context, cardiogenic shock complicates between 5 to 10% of all acute MIs. It is the most common cause for MI associated in hospital mortality. So mortality rates are estimated to be between 40 and 50%. In today's podcast, we are going to answer some key questions. Specifically, what factors make patients with acute MIs and cardiogenic shock a challenge to manage in the first place? How are patients with cardiogenic shock different from those with acute MIs without shock? And why has PCI and emergency revascularization become the gold standard of management? Finally, we will be looking at the paper, One Year Outcomes in PCI After Cardiogenic Shock, also called Culprit Shock by Telia Tal that is being published in the journal in print in October and is available as an online first to evaluate how many vessels should the cardiologist be stenting in these patients and why. So joining us in discussion and to answer these questions is Dr. John Jarko. He is a cardiologist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, assistant professor in cardiovascular medicine at Harvard Medical School and a deputy editor at the New England Journal of Medicine. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you very much. So I guess I'll just fire away. So to begin with, let's discuss the role of coronary artery disease in these patients with acute MI and cardiogenic shock. To answer that first question, what do we mean when we say an acute MI is being complicated by cardiogenic shock? And in what ways are these patients particularly challenging? So these patients are complicated. They're more unwell than an acute MI patient who is not in cardiogenic shock. They're hemodynamically unstable. By definition, they suffer from end-organ hypoperfusion, resulting in renal, hepatic, and neurological dysfunction. From the coronary disease standpoint, 80% of these patients have multivessel coronary artery disease rather than single-vessel disease, and multivessel disease is associated with higher mortality than single-vessel disease. In addition, patients who develop cardiogenic shock have higher baseline cardiovascular risk, they're more likely to have a pre-existing history of coronary disease, impaired cardiac reserve, diabetes, and hypertension. Hmm. Okay, so that's quite interesting. That all makes sense. But I think most of our listeners will be familiar with the process of atherosclerosis, plaque rupture, and thrombus formation that underlies acute MIs. But how do we go from there to acute ischemia and cardiogenic shock? Can you give us a basic overview of the pathophysiology? Sure. So in these patients, ischemia is not merely a focal process, but it profoundly reduces myocardial contractility, and this leads to global left ventricular dysfunction. Mm -hmm. If the left ventricular dysfunction is severe enough, then compensatory physiologic mechanisms are overcome, and end-organ hypoperfusion occurs. In these patients, death is often due to the resulting multisystem organ failure. Now, with improvements in the treatment and prevention of coronary artery disease, the incidence and mortality of cardiogenic shock have trended down since the 1990s, but this is still a major problem when it occurs. Mm, Okay, yeah, and as we said, still occurs in about 40 to 50% of all of these patients. Mm. So I guess if we anchor this on a clinical case, say I have a man, he's a 68-year-old man, he develops central crushing chest pain that radiates down his left arm and is present for about 30 minutes. And this is associated with nausea and diaphoresis. So you mentioned that these patients are at higher cardiovascular risk. So he has the usual constellation of risk factors. He's hypertensive, he's poorly controlled type 2 diabetes, he has high cholesterol. So the ambulance is called, and at the time of ambulance arrival, his blood pressure is 90 on 50 millimetres of mercury, and his pulse is now 88 beats per minute. Oxygen saturation is 95 on room air. The paramedics make a note that his skin is cold and clammy, and then they perform an EKG, and there is ST elevation in the anterolateral leads. Having 
recently completed my medical residency. I understand that the gold standard for treatment for this patient is to perform a very prompt revascularization by a percutaneous intervention. But are you able to tell us a little bit about how this practice evolved to be and the evidence behind this practice? Sure. So prior to the routine use of early revascularization, the mortality rate of acute myocardial infarction complicated by cardiogenic shock was very high with in-hospital mortality rates exceeding 80%. Mm. Early revascularization was not always performed at that time due to both a lack of facilities and also to doubt regarding the efficacy of revascularization in an already compromised mm. patient. Yeah. There were a number of initial studies of revascularization that were small and non-randomized with evidence of selection bias in the study cohorts. So the real breakthrough was a study called the SHOCK trial, standing for Should We Emergently Revascularize Occluded Coronaries for Cardiovascular Shock? This is a trial that was published in the New England Journal in 1999. In the SHOCK trial, which was a randomized multicenter trial, there were 302 patients with acute MI complicated by cardiogenic shock, uh -huh. and they were randomized to receive either emergency revascularization, which could be by either angioplasty or coronary artery bypass grafting, or initial medical stabilization. Those patients who were randomized to revascularization were to receive a procedure within six hours for medical treatment, these patients received intensive medical therapy, which included the use of intraortic balloon pumps and fibrinolysis. Oh, wow. And for the patients who were in the control group, revascularization was permitted after 54 hours of follow-up. Mm -hmm. In this trial, the primary outcome was 30-day mortality, and there was a difference between the two groups in 30-day mortality. 46.7% with revascularization versus 56.0% with medical therapy, this difference was not actually statistically significant mm -hmm. with a P of 0.11. However, mm -hmm. one of the secondary outcomes was six-month mortality, mm -hmm. and this was also uh, higher in the medical therapy group. With the revascularization group, it was 50.3%. And in mm -hmm. the medical therapy group was 63.1%. And this difference was statistically significant with a p-value of 0 0.027. So successful revascularization in this trial was associated with a significant mortality benefit at six months, although the benefit was not statistically significant at 30 days. And this trial was sort of the turning point mm -hmm. in terms of thinking about the use of revascularization in acute MI complicated by cardiogenic shock. It's interesting to think that this practice has only been in place since the early 2000s, actually. So the other question I had, so with the emergence of acute revascularization or emergent revascularization in these patients, you mentioned that they had improved six-month mortality, but then was this mortality maintained out into the long term? Sure. So, in fact, the trial investigators did follow up the patients over the longer term, and the improvement in mortality was maintained. In a subsequent paper that they published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2006, mm -hmm. they reported on the three-year survival rates, which were better in the revascularized group at 41.4% versus 28.3%. And at six years, the rates were 32.8% and 19.6%. So at six years, the absolute difference in survival rates was 13.2%. And the hazard ratio for this follow-up was 0.74 with a p-value of 0.03. So a significant benefit that lasted into the long term. Oh. And this is the primary paper, really, the primary trial that's kind of shaped what we practice now. And that's... Really, really interesting. Okay. Hmm. So returning to the patient, he then arrives at the emergency department. His 12-lead EKG demonstrates clear ST elevation in the anterolateral leads. His blood pressure has dropped further to 84 on 45 millimetres of mercury, and his pulse is now 96 beats per minute, and his oxygen saturation is dropping. It's 90% on room air. And the patient feels very lightheaded and is intermittently difficult to rouse. So he's taken to the cath lab for PCI, where the culprit lesion in the mid-left anterior descending artery is identified. So 
John, you've told us that 80% of these patients with acute MI and cardiogenic shock have multivessel disease. So let's say critical stenoses are also noted in other vessels, for example, say left circumflex and the right coronary artery. I guess the question then is, should the cardiologist be performing PCI and stenting to all these critical stenoses in this patient with the combination of shock at this time, or should he only be stenting the corporate lesion? Where, what would be the approach in this sort of situation? So this has been an area that has been another area of significant controversy. It is unclear or has been unclear whether performing immediate multivessel revascularization on an unstable, sick patient is associated with benefit or with harm. Mm -hmm. In the original shock trial that we've discussed before, outcomes in patients who received PCI usually got culprit lesion-only PCI, Mm -hmm. and in those who received cabbage, which often involved multiple grafts, the outcomes were similar for these two groups. Mm -hmm. 64% of the patients underwent PCI compared with 36% who underwent cabbage. Mm -hmm. But the study wasn't really designed to compare the two, and this wasn't a randomized uh, comparison. The 30-day and six-year mortality between patients who underwent cabbage and those who underwent PCI was no different, even though cabbage patients were considered more sick. That is, they were more likely to have left main disease and triple Mm -hmm. vessel disease. And yet, despite that difference, the outcomes didn't differ. So this result did raise questions regarding the additional benefit of multivessel revascularization over just culprit vessel revascularization in these sicker patients. The theoretical argument used to support multivessel revascularization is the potential to improve overall myocardial perfusion and therefore to improve ventricular function. Mm -hmm. This potential benefit has been evaluated in trials in hemodynamically stable patients, so a different population, such as the Compare Acute trial, which was published in the journal in 2017. So in that trial, they enrolled 885 hemodynamically stable patients, so patients not in cardiogenic shock, who had an acute SD elevation myocardial infarction. These patients were randomized to either multivessel or culprit vessel only PCI. The composite outcome of death, myocardial infarction, revascularization, and stroke occurred in 23 patients with multivessel PCI and in 121 patients with culprit vessel only PCI. So this clearly favored the multivessel rather than the culprit lesion approach. However, it's important to appreciate that the component of the primary outcome that drove the difference between the two groups was repeat revascularization, which, as you might expect, was higher in the culprit lesion group since it was obviously going to be necessary at some point to go back and revascularize the lesions that hadn't been revascularized initially. The study was not designed to evaluate the hard endpoints of mortality or recurrent MI alone. To the extent that they had data on that comparison, there wasn't a significant difference, but the numbers were oh, small. Okay. Oh, that's really, really interesting. I think that's a key distinction that we should be making for our listeners, that that's where the patients with the cardiogenic shock and those who are hemodynamically are stable. So I guess going to just summarize very quickly what we've discussed. So what we now know is that early revascularization in acute MIs and cardiogenic shock is life-saving and is associated with long-term survival benefits. What we've seen is some potential of benefit in multivessel revascularization in these patients, but most of these studies have involved the hemodynamically stable patients with acute MI rather than those who are in overt cardiogenic shock. So If we go back to the patient in our scenario now who has acute MI and cardiogenic shock, should we be trying to perform multivessel PCI? So this is a question that the culprit shock study really tries to answer, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Culprit shock was published in the journal in December of 2017 with 30-day outcomes, and its follow-up with one-year outcomes was published online this past August and will be published in print in October. Culprit shock asks this question, does PCI of the culprit lesion only, 
with the option of staged revascularization of the non-culprit lesions later result in better clinical outcomes than immediate multivessel revascularization. So in this trial, 706 patients with an acute MI, cardiogenic shock defined by a set of pre-specified criteria, and multivessel disease with at least two major vessels with a greater than 70% stenosis, were randomized to either PCI of the culprit lesion only with the option of staged revascularization or multivessel revascularization immediately. The mean age of the participants was 70 years, three quarters were men, and they were very sick. Notably, about half of these patients had required resuscitation before enrollment in the trial. The primary outcome was a composite of death from any cause or severe renal failure leading to renal replacement therapy at 30 days. In the culprit lesion only group, the primary outcome occurred in 45.9% of patients, whereas in the immediate multivessel group, the primary outcome occurred in a higher number in 55.4% of patients. So culprit lesion only PCI was associated with a relative risk of 0.83 with a p-value of 0.01, a lower event rate for the culprit lesion-only approach. In addition, a very important pre-specified secondary outcome at 30 days was death from any cause. And here again, in the culprit lesion-only group, the event rate was 43.3%. In the multivessel group, it was 51.6% for a relative risk of 0.84 and a p-value of 0.03. So culprit shock found that in patients with acute MI, cardiogenic shock, and multivessel disease, culprit lesion PCI was associated with improved mortality and a lower need for renal replacement therapy at 30 days compared with multivessel revascularization. As expected, a greater proportion of the culprit lesion-only patients did later require staged revascularization. So then culprit shock demonstrated a survival benefit just from performing the PCI on the culprit lesion rather than going for a multivessel approach then. Yes, specifically culprit shock demonstrated that PCI of the culprit lesion only led to improved mortality alone at 30 days. The reason for this mortality difference may be that in patients with cardiogenic shock, it is safer to try to perform the interventional procedure as quickly as possible and not to prolong the time spent in the cath lab during the intervention. Mm -hmm. The duration of the procedure, at least as indicated by the amount of fluoroscopy time in the trial, was about 50% longer with multivessel PCI. Other parameters, such as the use of mechanical circulatory support, mechanical ventilation, antiplatelet and anticoagulant drug use, and the time to hemodynamic stabilization did not significantly differ between the two groups. Hmm, okay, that's really interesting. Okay, so what culprit shock has shown, at least in 30 days, is that perhaps in these sicker patients, we should be minimizing the amount of time we spend performing a procedure and just getting the lesion that is the cause of the pathology here. And then, so although immediate vessel revascularization appeared to be associated with greater harm at 30 days, what about one year out? So Culprit shock, the most recent publication that's come out in the journal, is the one-year follow-up, right? And what did this show? That's correct. So one of the concerns about culprit shock when the short-term data were published was it's all very well that perhaps in the short term, not revascularizing all of the lesions might have some advantages. But there was concern that perhaps leaving the other lesions unrevascularized in the longer term would result in worse outcomes, and so that perhaps the benefit seen early would be countered by a greater risk at later follow-up. And therefore, the trial specifically planned to evaluate one-year outcomes. These are all pre-specified as secondary outcomes because the primary outcome was, of course, at 30 days. But given that, these results are as follows. For the outcome of death from any cause, there was no statistically significant difference between the two groups, being 50% in the culprit lesion-only group and 56.9% in the multivessel group. There was also no statistically significant difference in the rate of recurrent myocardial infarction. And 
This actually occurred in a relatively small number of patients, 1.7% in the culprit lesion group and 2.1% in the multivessel group. On the other hand, rehospitalization for congestive heart failure, interestingly and perhaps notably, appeared to occur more often in the culprit lesion only group at 5.2% versus 1.2%, with a relative risk of 446 So there is some possibility that what the trial is telling us that, in fact, there is a higher risk of congestive heart failure with the culprit lesion-only approach at one year. I'm going to ask, I know this paper has only come out very recently, but has the cardiology community or the interventional community been swayed by this? Do you anticipate that this will change practice? Has it really changed practice in your experience or what you've seen? So it's a good question. This study does have a number of limitations, even though I think overall it's been pretty well done. It's important to recognize that the original study was powered for the 30-day outcome. And so the one-year outcomes here can only be really considered to be exploratory. And therefore, the assurance that there are no longer-term risks associated with culprit lesion-only PCI is a little bit more provisional, perhaps, than the relatively solid information at 30 days. Mm -hmm. In the original study, also, 75 patients did cross over between study groups for various reasons. The analysis was performed as intention to treat, which is usually considered to be the most appropriate way to do this. But it does indicate that in some clinical circumstances, patients will be treated by a different modality than what was assigned. Mm -hmm. And it's also important to recognize that the trial could not be blinded. The investigators knew whether a patient was receiving multivessel or culprit lesion only PCI. However, this trial does aim to replicate the real world situation of cardiogenic shock and myocardial infarction, as well as a randomized controlled trial really can. All available resuscitation measures were used decision-making on final PCI approach was up to the treating clinician based on the clinical situation. All patients had multivessel coronary disease and associated comorbidities, as would be expected in this patient group. So this study really does give us the most comprehensive indication to date on how best to approach these difficult patients. One interesting area of increasing interest in this field is the use of mechanical circulatory support during PCI. In culprit shock, about one quarter of the patients had some kind of mechanical support, most often, in this case, intraaortic balloon pumps. But with the development of percutaneous ventricular assist devices, it is now possible to support perfusion much more effectively during PCI procedures, and it is possible that with such methods in greater use, multivessel PCI in cardiogenic shock will be a safer procedure. Oh, how interesting. So then moving forward, would you anticipate that the follow-up to these sorts of studies would be then to look at how these other mechanical support assist in potentially reducing mortality rates even further? Is that the next study after this? Do we need any more studies actually looking at percutaneous intervention in this patient group? What do you think? Well, I think that's correct. I mean, one of the challenges, of course, of clinical research is that practice is always evolving. And what you learn from a study today is influenced by the ways in which treatment evolves in the future. So it's probably correct to say that the information from this trial in the present environment play an important role in determining how patients are managed with acute MI and cardiogenic shock in the present time. As mechanical assist evolves, I think it's likely that another trial will need to be done to try to address the question of Yes, but what if you can support these patients effectively with ventricular assist? Under those circumstances, perhaps the long procedure is no longer a liability. Yeah, of course. Okay. How interesting. So thanks a lot, John, and thanks for joining us in conversation today as we took a deeper dive into the papers of the New England Journal of Medicine. Certainly, acute myocardial infarctions and cardiogenic shock is definitely something all residents encounter, and at times I think we definitely take the current practice for granted, but it's absolutely useful to explore how the primary studies have informed daily clinical practice. 
I hope we've given our listeners a bit more insight into both key aspects of clinical practice and a point of access to the primary literature that makes up New England Journal of Medicine. So, by taking a deep dive into the literature surrounding the management of acute MI and cardiogenic shock, what have we learned and how has this shaped practice? Well, firstly, patients with cardiogenic shock and myocardial infarct are not the same as those with myocardial infarct alone. They are hemodynamically unstable, they are more likely to have multivessel disease, and they're more likely to have a higher baseline cardiovascular risk. So the most effective treatment for these patients are likely to differ from those with acute myocardial infarct alone. We learnt that in the early days of cardiogenic shock and acute MI, there was reservation in performing early PCI. It was thought that early PCI could exacerbate and worsen the shock compared with medical management only. However, the shock trial that came out in 1999 in the journal demonstrated the survival benefit for early PCI And this was a long-term benefit that was drawn out to six years and has absolutely changed clinical practice. This early study raised the question as to whether multivessel approach to revascularization could be superior to culprit lesion PCI only in these patients. And studies in hemodynamically stable patients with MI have shown improved composite outcomes with multivessel PCI. However, these outcomes are primarily driven by endpoints of repeat revascularization rather than hard endpoints of mortality or repeat myocardial infarction. So culprit shock, which is initially published in the journal in December of 2017, was a randomized control trial that evaluated 706 patients with acute MI, cardiogenic shock and multivessel coronary artery disease. And it gives the strongest indication to date that culprit lesion PCI appears to be associated with lower 30-day mortality than multivessel PCI. And on follow-up out to a year, there does not appear to have any further detrimental effects on mortality or rate of repeat myocardial infarction. In closing, I just wanted to thank everyone for listening to this episode. And please visit our guide for coronary artery disease at Rotation Prep at resident360.nejm.org. I want to thank our expert today, Dr. John Jarko, and our production team here at NEJM Resident 360, including Karen Buckley, Carl Simmons, Mike Tomasis, Tim Vining, Scott Williams, and Kathy Stern. Also, special thanks to Dr. Angela Castellanos and Dr. Amanda Fernandez, who are my co-editorial fellows at NEJM this year and also to our NEJM educational editor, Dr. O.P. Hammondvik. Now, because this is a new series and we're trying something new, we want your feedback. So please email us at resident360 at nejm.org. Leave a message or review wherever you get your podcasts or feel free to reach out to us via the NEJM Resident 360 website. We are also available via various social media sites, including Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Just search for NEJM. I'm Dr. Angela Chen, Editorial Fellow at NAJM. Please join us again for our next episode.